Thank you, Miles. Good evening. We're making our way through the book of Proverbs as we uh, do on a Sunday evening. So if you have a copy of God's Word, could you turn to Proverbs 19? Reading the second half of Proverbs 19, verses 17 to 29. Proverbs 19, verse 17. This is God's word. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. A man of great wrath will pay a penalty, for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. What is desired in a man is steadfast love, and a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has at rest satisfied, he will not be visited by harm. The sluggard buries his hands in the dish, and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will learn prudence. Reprove a man of understanding, and he will gain knowledge. He who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A worthless witness mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Condemnation is ready for scoffers and beating for the backs of fools. Ending our reading at verse 29. Just a quick word of prayer before we sing again. My heart is filled with thankfulness. Uh, Let's just unite our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. And thank you for this book of Proverbs written by the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon. Thank you for the instruction from your word. We thank you for the privilege in this holiday week to gather around the word of God this evening, to study your word, and to call out to you in prayer. We want to thank you for answer prayer for our morning service as we concluded our study in the book of Daniel. We thank you for the boys and girls and their willingness and their desire to memorize God's word, and in particular, Psalm 1. And we pray that they would hide that word in their hearts that they would not sin against you. We thank you for everyone here this evening. We thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you that you're a God, as we we found out on Wednesday night, that you're a God who is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if anyone is in the building tonight, young person or older person, or anyone listening, Lord, on to the recording, we pray that if they're not Christians, that you'll work in their hearts tonight, Lord. Bring that deep conviction of sin and draw them to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior of sinners. We thank you that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And thank you that tonight we're still in the day of grace. And we have another opportunity tonight to open the Word of God, to study the Word of God, and to proclaim Christ and him crucified. So we commit our evening to you. We pray, Lord, that you just shut us in with yourself for this hour. And Lord, we thank you for the joy it is to be a Christian tonight, to know that as we sung this morning, we are ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven, all because of your matchless and magnificent grace. Committing the service to you now, in our Savior's name. Amen. We're turning tonight to uh, the work, the Word of God in Luke's Gospel. We have a copy of God's Word, Luke chapter 18. beginning at verse 9. I've been preaching in this church for almost seven years, and I've preached a considerable number of messages on prayer, uh, the priority of prayer, the power of prayer, the potential of prayer, the problem of prayer, uh, and in particular, unanswered prayer. But tonight, we're going to consider how not to pray in the verses that we're looking together tonight from Luke chapter 18 and verses 9 
14. I want to read Luke 18, beginning at verse 9. He, that's Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went unto the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank God for his word. The world is divided into two groups of people. And it's not just those who like Hugo Duncan and those who don't like Hugo Duncan, you can ask me afterwards which group I belong to. It's not those who want England to win tonight and those who want Italy to win. It's not men and women. It's not Protestant and Catholic, Jew and Gentile, black and white. It's quite simply those who are saved and those who are lost. The boys and girls have been memorizing Psalm 1 on Sunday mornings and Psalm 1 sets before us unmistakably these two sets of people, the righteous and the ungodly. Those who are on the narrow road that leads to life, those who are on the broad road that leads to destruction. And as you sit here this evening, you can only be on one of those two roads. There, aren't, there isn't another road. There's only the narrow road that leads to life and the broad road that leads to destruction. And no matter what age you are, from the youngest person here, you're in either one of those two roads. You can't sit on the fence and claim to be neutral. Your life is either under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ or under the control of Satan. And you know in your heart tonight exactly which group you belong to. Either trusting in good works or saving grace self-righteous religion, or soul-saving redemption. In this parable tonight in Luke chapter 18, we see a person from each group. This parable is one of Luke's favorite type of stories, favorite types of parable. It's a who gets saved story. It's a who goes to heaven story. Compare two people and leave us to ask the question, who was saved and who was not saved. First of all, we see the audience tonight. At the beginning of this parable, we see exactly who is listening. Look at verse 9 says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. The audience that day were in the camp that believed the way to heaven is based on what we do. They have this notion that human achievement is the way to earn God's favor. This is the way to be saved. What we do, what we contribute, how we get saved. They believe that the way to heaven is down to us. We get to God by being good, morally or religiously. And the kingpins, the experts at this particular group, were the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders in Israel. And as you may know, the Lord Jesus had many confrontations with these people. In Luke 16, verse 15, he told them, You're those who justify yourselves before God, but God knows your heart. The Pharisees were the architects of this particular belief that we can gain credit with God by trying hard. 
by being religious, by going to church. So that God will look at us and see that we've done our best and he led us into heaven. The Pharisees, this audience, hated this upstart preacher from Nazareth, the Lord Jesus, because he spent time with real sinners, outcasts. He touched lepers. He gave women their place. And their resentment of Jesus was absolutely maxed out now as we come to the closing chapters of Luke's gospel. But the Lord Jesus saw right through them. He knew they were hypocrites. He called them whited sepulchers or brooded vipers. And some of them are in the audience that day and they're listening to Jesus recount this parable. That's the audience. Let me look secondly at the prayers. And Jesus tells the audience that day of two men going to church to pray. And there are a number of similarities between these two men. First of all, they're both men. They're going to the same place of worship at the same time of the day. It's the afternoon service, probably 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And they're very easy to spot in church. The Pharisee sat in the front row. The Pharisee didn't mind people looking at him. The other man, the tax collector, he's easy to spot as well, but only from the front. He stands at the very back. He doesn't want anybody to see him. And as you can see in the parable, these two men are doing the same thing. They're praying. And they're both praying to the same God, Jehovah. The Pharisee, he was from that group of people who were the Bible-believing people of the day, the ultra-conservatives. They respected the law of God. And Jesus said about these men, unless your righteousness exceeds these people, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. And the Pharisee's prayer starts off well enough. He was thankful for God's grace in his life. He was thankful that God had protected him from making a shipwreck of his life. He hadn't stolen from anyone. He had been faithful to his wife. But as he continues, we see most definitely how not to pray. Notice how self-absorbed this man is. How many times he uses the personal pronoun, I, five times. Someone has said he was stoned on self. This was just really a time of self-congratulation disguised as prayer. But the worst part of the prayer was when he compared himself to the man at the back of the church, the tax collector. in an effort to emphasize his own virtue, his own cleanness. He built himself up by knocking others down. He didn't care or love his neighbor. And sad to say, some Christians make the same mistake as this Pharisee. They build themselves up by knocking other people down. They compare themselves to others and they're awash with self-praise. I'm glad I didn't go there. I'm glad I didn't get involved in that sin. I'm glad my children aren't roaming the streets. I'm glad I have no real needs. Glad I'm motivated by hard work. They're like the people mentioned in verse 9. They trust in themselves that they were righteous. See, the truth is, a life that finds its security in comparison to others is tragic and deluded. And it runs completely against the grain of the gospel. 
and it runs completely against the mindset of the greatest Christian who ever lived apart from Christ, the Apostle Paul, who described himself as the chief of sinners. The tax collector, on the other hand, wasn't so respectable. The Romans hired the Jews, some of these Jewish men, to collect taxes for them. They were allowed to keep for themselves whatever they collected above the going rate. They set their own interest rates. They would charge above the going rate. And they were looked upon as the scum and the very dregs of society. They were extortioners. They were swindlers. They were cheats. The lowest of the low, taking advantage of the poor and lining their own pockets at the same time. They were filthy rich. They were charlatans and frauds, the complete opposite of the Pharisee sitting in the front row. In today's culture, they will be drug dealers, pimps, loan sharks who prey on vulnerable people and make money for themselves. And the very best of these tax collectors had moved to Jerusalem in Jesus' day. This was the place to be. This is where the money was. And the people listening to Jesus tell this parable about this tax collector would think this man has made it big time. He's loads of cash, nothing he needs. And he arrives at the afternoon service. He doesn't know how things work in church. He doesn't know the order of service. He doesn't know how to behave in church. And we're told he beat his breast. That wasn't the normal practice for a man to do. A woman did that, but not men in public. And he stands at the back of the church. He doesn't want anybody to see him. And he can't even lift up his head as he prays. He doesn't want anybody to see him. And he's completely immersed in guilt. He felt condemned. Unlike the Pharisee, he has no brownie points with God. His life was a mess. He hasn't come for show. He has come to seek the Lord. And unlike the Pharisee, he didn't compare himself to other people. He simply cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Literally, God be merciful to me, the sinner. There's nobody as bad as me. I'm everything that people say about me and worse. I wouldn't dare compare myself to anyone else. I'm too far gone. God, would you be merciful to me? You may be familiar with the opening line of Psalm 51, the Psalm penned by David after her he committed adultery with Bathsheba after he arranged the murder of her husband, Uriah the Hittite. That penitential psalm begins with these words, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Maybe this, this tax collector's life has hit rock bottom. But someone has told him, God loves you. Someone has told him about Jesus. And he has come in search of what only God can give. Mercy. Forgiveness. The tax collector's hope is that if God could forgive David's sin, he could forgive his sin. He knew God was angry with the wicked every day. And he simply pleads for mercy. The audience, the prayers, what about the verdict? So who gets to heaven? Who gets saved? There are a number of reasons why it might not be the tax collector. He's an extortioner who forced money out of people. He's unjust to the poor and the weak. More than likely, he was an adulterer. He was unable to look God in the face. He hadn't been to the temple for years. He doesn't know how to pray properly. 
Let me tell you a number of reasons why it could be the Pharisee who gets saved. He never misses a service at church. He knows how to pray regularly. He is, like our hymn said, his heart is full of thankfulness. He gives thanks to God for the blessings in his life. He has lived an absolutely exemplary life. He's much different than other people. He's much more respectable than the tax collector standing at the back. He was a very decent man. He wasn't greedy. He wasn't selfish. He wasn't unscrupulous like the tax collector standing at the back. And if you had to choose between a society made up of the Pharisee sitting in the front row or the tax collector standing at the back, you would choose the Pharisee all day long. He would be the type of man you'd want to be living next door to. I believe, lastly, the Pharisee is more like me and more like you than the tax collector is. And if he applied for church membership, and if he was interviewed for church membership, he would sail through the interview process. Because he read his Bible every day. He tithed everything that he earned. He fasted every Monday and every Thursday. And most of the crowd listening to Jesus tell this story would have concluded, the Pharisee gets to heaven. The Pharisee is saved. He's every box ticked. It must be him. It has to be him. One thing is missing from the Pharisee's prayer. He didn't need to ask God for mercy. Because in his opinion, he didn't need anything. He had life all sussed out. Bottom line is, he didn't need a savior. He was managing very well on his own. He was trusting in his own goodness. He didn't need mercy because in his opinion, his life pleased God. He earned favor with God. He impressed God with his religious activity. He didn't need to sing, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Because his soul wasn't burdened. So he didn't need pardon. The tax collector standing at the back knew deep down in his heart that he was morally and spiritually bankrupt. And he simply cried out, God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. He didn't add anything that to earn credit with God. He didn't compare himself to anyone else. He simply threw himself on the mercy of God, and he literally says, find a sacrifice that will atone for my sin. The only other place in this phrase is used in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 2, where it speaks of the Lord Jesus, our merciful high priest, and how he atoned for our sins on the cross. A few months after the Lord Jesus told this parable, he would be arrested, he would be condemned to death, and he would be executed by crucifixion. See, God cannot shrug off our sins. God cannot sweep our sins under the carpet because he would not be just and he would not be righteous. The penalty for sins has to be paid. Either we pay it or we trust God to pay it on our behalf through an acceptable sacrifice in our room instead. You see, to cry out like the Pharisee did 
is to trust the only provision that God has made for the penalty of our sins, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the cross, on that first Good Friday, he would die for a world of bankrupt, broken sinners like us. He would die for people like the tax collector standing at the evening service. Who at that evening service would watch an animal being slain. And as a sacrifice was made, he would wonder to himself, is there any sacrifice that can take away my sin? And the one who told this parable would be the one who would take away sins. He would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, the tax collector got the gospel. He knew God's standard was perfection. And like us, he had to outsource his protection, perfection in Jesus. He knew he needed mercy. And having repented, genuinely repented from his heart, this outcast, this leper of society, left the temple justified and all his sins are gone. God's wrath turned away in an instant. And Jesus tells the crowd he went home justified. He was the one who was saved. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. If you're here tonight, and not a Christian, not saved, don't be like the Pharisee who told God all the stuff that he'd done to please him. He should have remembered what the prophet Isaiah wrote, that even our righteous acts are like filthy rags in God's sight. We can't earn favor with God. Be like the tax collector with no credit rating with God. Deeply aware of his sin and simply call upon God to show you mercy in the sacrifice that was made for sins at the place called Calvary. That's the prayer God hears. And that's the prayer God answers. Two prayers. Two very different prayers. The cream of Hebrew society and the scum of Hebrew society. One proud of his own righteousness, the other ashamed of his sin. One proud, the other humble. One saved, the other lost. One shows us clearly how not to pray. One shows us clearly how to pray humbly, penitentially, honestly. The Pharisee would have a different version for our closing hymn tonight, Rock of Ages. He would say, may the labors of my hands all fulfill thy law's demands. But the tax collector would sing it correct, right from his heart. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. How not to pray? Like the Pharisee. How to pray? Like the tax collector. With deep humility. That's the prayer God hears. That's the prayer God answers. We're going to sing... A closing hymn, I mentioned their Rock of Ages, Clef for Me.
Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior of sinners. Thank you for this wonderful parable in Luke's gospel. We thank you that we've seen tonight how not to pray. Help us to be like that tax collector to come to you humbly and reverently and intensely acknowledging our sin. If anyone here tonight is not a Christian, we pray that they would run to Christ, that they put their trust in him, the only Savior of sinners. Thank you for your gracious hand upon our lives throughout today. We commit ourselves to you on our onward journey home, praying you keep us safe until we meet again. For Jesus' sake, amen.